Now on Zero Block 30, I am privileged to have John Creasel. And before I really get down to the nitty gritty, I constantly go on and try to find different people that come on the show and we'll tweet at them, tell them to DM me if they're interested. John, you had one of the strongest reactions I've seen. Like as soon as I put it out, like 500 people were like, hell yeah, let's do this. That's awesome. That means a lot. Yeah. So where, how did you get this? Because you have like 40,000 followers on Twitter. You uh, were in the state house in your, in your state for Minnesota. Minnesota, right? Yes. Yeah. So you're in Minnesota. Usually a state representative doesn't have that many followers on Twitter. How did you garner your following? Well, the, well, when I was in the legislature, I just served one term and then left. But um, I was a little bit outside of what you would picture a politician to be or, or the, the way that I voted. Um, but also on top of that, I'm on uh, the number one rated morning show in the in the market on on Friday mornings, uh, KFAN Power Trip Morning Show. So that's got a very loyal following and a, and a bunch of people that are very active on social media. So it's a blast. I love it. So yeah, that was that was fun last night. I saw that. I'm like, all right, I'm excited. Yeah, man, it, it's it's a good thing. And I saw that you get. You are living kind of like what a lot of people want to do when they get out. Like you're involved in sports entertainment, you're speak doing guest speaking and things like that. You are really living like a, a pretty model life of what a lot of veterans want to do. And it's been interesting for me, even in the last 24 hours or really 12, when I've really tried to dive into your story of how you got there. So for the people that don't know you, I want to kind of dig into that because you gained a little notoriety when you came back from a deployment. Um, and yesterday you had a tweet that was your on, on your alive day, which we've talked about on this show a, a ton, what an alive right. day is. Can you walk us through what happened to you in Fallujah? Yes. So we were on a deployment 2006 to Iraq. We're uh, attached to Marine Headquarter Group. Uh, on Camp Fallujah, and we were an Army unit, though. I was in the Minnesota Army National Guard, uh, so the Army just kind of gave us to the Marines. So it was a unique experience. I loved it. Where I was a team leader. Uh, my MOS was infantry, mm -hmm. and I had two Marines in my team, so it was a, a blended unit. It was, uh, it was awesome. So we were on a patrol near Fallujah on December 2nd, 2006. What town? Uh, I think it was close to Zidon. Okay, because I got I got injured in karma. Okay, and that, um, so yeah, and some of our guys after I got hurt ended up over there. They kind of spread people out, but the um, yeah, so that was December second, two thousand six, and we're uh, on a patrol to go check out. We had volunteered. Now, are you? They called it the nutsack on the map, mm -hmm. where the Euphrates River dipped down in the shape of a of a scrotum. <laughs> uh, I hadn't been down in that area before. But we were going, there was someone digging in the road and one of the Raven drones, you know, like the Radio Shack type mm -hmm. <laughs> unmanned drones spotted someone digging in the road. So they sent us there. We're headed down there. Bradley fighting vehicle ahead of us. And we encountered a 200 pound improvised explosive device. Our left front tire hit it and it detonated directly underneath our vehicle and uh, killed two of my best friends. Uh, injured me i lost both of my legs left one above the knee right one below the knee uh, uh definitely the worst day in my life but definitely taught me a number of lessons moving forward that has made me appreciate the, the rest of my life yeah and i've listened to some of those stories and one thing that i really resonated with you was when you were injured and you talk about opening your eyes for the first time and seeing what was going on around for our listeners can you kind of walk them through what you like your emotional state when that's going on because a lot of times we hear these stories and you think of somebody like you like now you're decorated you're you're what the army wants and like their leaders and going after it and you hear these stories and you think oh well john's probably like a last action hero but i'm sure in your brain that's not what was going on you're still a human who was terrified Absolutely. Yeah. So when the bomb went off, I heard it was a metallic clank. And I presume that that's because they were packed into propane tanks. So we kind of heard it detonate. Mm -hmm. And Tim, one of my closest friends, he was my squad leader. He was in the seat behind me. 
uh, he remembers the same thing, that sound. So I was knocked unconscious initially for maybe 20 seconds because when I woke up on the ground, I still heard the rocks falling from the gravel road. It sounded like a hailstorm. And so I heard Tim yelling, what's going on? What happened? I absolutely didn't want to believe what had just happened. But I, I joke that I've been a Vikings fan my whole life. So I'm used to the worst case scenario at any given time. So yeah, uh, I it my sounds head. like a, if you're a Vikings fan, it might have been at the very last day of your of your deployment, though. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, so the uh, when I opened my eyes, I saw we had a brand new fully up armored Humvee. We had ripped the plastic off the seats like a, a couple weeks before. And because when it was hot, we'd be sliding around or mm-hmm. ass would be sweaty and stuff like that. So we tore it off. Um, so it was like brand new, fully armored, the best you could get. And it just got opened up like a can of peaches. So the vehicle is on its side, facing the, the opposite direction from where we're headed. Parts of the doors, uh, which take at least a couple guys to lift on the armored Humvee doors, those were blown like a football field in every direction. Wow. Parts of the vehicle everywhere. And I was in this twisted, contorted position. So I knew I had been injured, but I didn't feel pain at that point. So I wasn't sure of my injury. So I started looking around, saw that my left arm was broken. That was kind of flopped there, but it was a closed fracture. So I held that against my chest. I remember really being concerned about, I don't want there to be any nerve damage in my arm. Mm -hmm. I looked down and saw that my left leg above the knee had, it was open and the femur was sticking out and it basically wasn't attached. The pant leg is probably what was holding it on. Mm -hmm. My right leg just below the knee looked like I had stuck it in a wood chipper and was bleeding a ton. So I was, I was certain that my life was going to end that day. I can't even imagine. And then, so you regain consciousness for a little bit, you go, then you talk about the next thing you remember as being in Walter Reed, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the guys in the vehicle ahead of us came back and you, you all, I'm sure Marines go through, you probably call it something other than combat lifesaver, but mm-hmm. we all go through combat no, lifesaver same thing. training. Yeah. Oh, same exact thing. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we didn't have a medic with us. So thankfully those guys were on it and they came back, put the tourniquets on. They kept, I, I'm thankful. And I think it's a reason that I'm able to have the outlook that I have now is I was awake until the helicopter took off and they're talking to me on the bird mm-hmm. and sitting there and I felt myself at one point getting cold. I told my buddy, tell my family, I love them. And he's like, shut up. You're going to tell them yourself. Uh, They worked their ass off to save my life. They didn't give up. And so remembering all of that, then when I woke up at Walter Reed eight days later and saw my injury, saw that my legs had been amputated, saw my arms were in casts. I had lost a portion of my intestines. Um, It, it allowed me really to to be thankful that I was alive in the first place and not sit there and go, man, this really sucks. And I immediately, when I woke up, it was uh, the the nurse was like, John, do you know where you're at? And so it was like, kind of like college. I had no idea where the fuck I was at. And so I looked, yeah. it was a hospital room. So I was like, well, am I in Germany? They said, no, you were just in Germany. You're now Walter Reed. Welcome home. I asked about my buddies, found out that kind of good news though, because that travel back from Iraq is terrible. Like, and you didn't have to deal with that long flight. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, I was I I was taking a nap on the on the flight. So they, uh, I I asked about my buddies, found out that Tim survived, but Corey and Brian did not, and so that was absolute rock bottom for me. Those were two of my best buds. Those were guys in my team that I was responsible for, and it put everything in perspective. And that was the moment that I said, it would be pretty shitty of me to sit here and feel sorry for myself, regardless of my injuries. I got a second chance at life that my friends didn't get. And so that really set the tone moving forward that I'm like, I need to just get through this and suck it up. Was that feeling pretty instantaneous or did it take a little while? Cause I like trying to put myself in that position when I opened my eyes and I was on uh, when I was in the field hospital in uh, Tikrit, whenever I opened up my eyes, I saw Sports Center was on. They were talking about the Kevin Garnett trade from Minnesota to sure. uh, Boston. I got shot on July 31st of 2007, the day that that okay. trade happened. So that's what I first saw on TV. <laughs> and I was like, huh, why is going to be different? Kevin Garnett's not in Minnesota anymore. He's right. in Boston. And then when they told me what happened and walked through, like what the prognosis for my injury was going to be, 
it took me a little while while I was laying in bed to kind of wrap my head around it. And my injuries aren't anywhere near what, what yours are. Did it take you any time to kind of roll it around in your brain and really come to grips with what life was going to be like for you? It, it did. I mean, it was, um, they're so good there though. The right away, they didn't really give me a chance to like sulk. And they told me the prosthetics now are amazing and this and that. A little bit later, I found out because my pelvis was shattered that I might not get to wear prosthetics. prosthetics. Thankfully, that all worked out. They did a good job on the surgery, but it did take uh, a little bit as reality was setting in. First thing that came back, you know, the sounds of the blast, the smell of the explosion, all of that was still with me. And so that was very real in the, in the situation. And once I realized like, okay, I'm alive. That's the first thing that, okay, I'm happy that I'm alive. Cause I didn't think I was going to be, mm-hmm. then I was able, you know, I found out that my buddies were dead and then it was more, there was a doctor that asked me to re- describe the whole thing. I couldn't get through more than a sentence or two without bawling. I mean, it was, mm-hmm. it was a lot at once, but then he, he stayed there and he's like, take your time. It's fine. I got through it. And then he's like, all right, talk to me again about it. And then it became easier and easier. And once that part, once the trauma of the actual explosion and how absolutely horrifying it is to lay there and think you're going to die, once that passed, then I was able to kind of pick up the pieces and go, all right, what's, what are my injuries besides the legs missing? And they went through that. So um, I'd say it was pretty quick, but it, but it wasn't, obviously there were tons of ups and downs and I'd take two steps forward, five steps back. And it was, you know, you feel like you're never getting out of the place and the walls start closing in. And me, like you've met with the nurse now and the doctor, when was the first time that you were able to connect with your family and how was that interaction? So at that time I was married to, to someone else. Um, and so that, uh, they, they were, she was there right away and I was able to kind of, you know, she explained certain things and, and whatnot, but then my, my dad and my sister arrived the day that I woke up. And so I, I saw them walk down the hall and come in. And, and at that time, especially they were more, they were more a priority than, than my ex-wife, which is why she's my ex-wife now. But right. um, once they were there, I felt like, okay, this is, this is fine. I didn't feel so alone. And I was able to then say, okay, we're going to, we're going to get through this. I'm not going to be doing it alone. And uh, I was still in the ICU at that point, but I hadn't, I started realizing that, okay, there's other people in the hospital that went through same thing I did or absolutely worse. And so as a team, we're going to all get through this at the same time. And I've found over the, over the years that looking back for me, July 31st of 2007 was kind of like a pinpoint on the map where my worldview changed, my thought process changed, how I viewed the world and what I want to accomplish here changed a lot. I listened to some of your speeches on the, on the floor of the house, and it seems that that is the same thing for you because you, you ran as a Republican, you're a Republican, and then you stood up in 2011 on the floor of the house and you talked about gay marriage and how your, your injury and the injuries to others and like influenced your political thought. Um, can you explain that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So before all that, I, I never thought I was gonna get into politics, maybe city council level or something. I've always been interested in it. Before all of that, I'd sit and I'd watch Fox News and be like, oh yeah, that hell yeah, that's, that's it. That's the, right, the, just exactly the same. It's the echo chamber that mm-hmm. Twitter can be a lot of times or whatnot. Right after what happened to me and similarly what happened to you you realize how important how precious life is and in the blink of an eye it can be gone and it makes you really i think it made me a more sympathetic person a lot less selfish where i looked at other people's situation and i i'd be lying if i said that i didn't think about what happened to me every day and it didn't shape my thoughts Mm -hmm. and so on the house floor when my republican party was pushing to have an amendment on the ballot that would that would make same-sex marriage uh, prohibited. It would be in the Minnesota State Constitution. I looked at it and said, "That is the, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. That is absolutely not the place of government." But at, on its face, it's mean. Why, mm. I mean, why would the government 
why should the government look at me and say, here's who you can marry? This is it. It needs to be this type of setup. That's it. And so that that gentleman and I, I used the, uh, the photo of an individual, uh, Corporal Andrew Wilford, who was killed in combat. Uh, he was from Minnesota. He's gay. And his parents gave me permission to use his story as an example that it's horrible that our country could or any elected officials can say, you know what, young man, you are good enough to die for your country, but you're not good enough to marry the person that you love. And that's when I stood up against my party. And there were, and I don't want to demonize the Republican Party because for one, they get demonized enough, but there was a a lot of people in that room that were Republicans that wanted to vote the way I did, but they were afraid of the repercussions, and I wasn't. And I think that was kind of the difference after having gone through what I did. Yeah, and I think once you've gone through some of the stuff that you have, there is this certain, like, I don't give a fuck, I'm going to say what I want to, like, type right. of attitude. And that's how that's exactly the way I feel. Like, when I think about freedom and what it means to be free, my idea of government is I don't give a shit what you do as long as right. you're not harming somebody to your left or your right and you're not infringing on their rights. Other than that, I don't give the fr- if I was going to die for like the fr- the ideal of freedom, buddy, you better be as free as you possibly can be. Like I don't right. want any restrictions on that at all. A hundred percent. And this, so I'm I'm pretty much more I'm more of a libertarian than anything. Mm-hmm. Socially, marry who you want, bang who you want weed should be legal. Mm-hmm. Don't like you said, don't be getting in your car all fucked up and, and driving around and stuff. But whatever you do, if it's not harming other people, that's not government's job. There's other shit, especially these days, there's other shit for them to worry about. And that was kind of the thing as I looked at it and it, in the caucus room where it's just other Republican representatives, I got emotional because I looked at them and I was like, what you're doing is going to be the biggest mistake you've ever made politically, not just because you're all going to lose your seats next uh, next term, and that happened, but um, but you're infringing on people's rights, and I don't think you can call yourself a conservative and say, I want government out of my life, except I think they should be telling you what to do in the bedroom. I mean, mm-hmm. what kind of hypocrisy is that? And so, Yeah, it makes um, no sense. <laughs> it's just, it, it's frustrating to this day, and so that's where um, politically, and I left on my own terms and people were like, we, we want you back in there and that's flattering. I feel like I did a good job, but at the same time too, I had to focus on my, my family life and, and uh, life is a lot better now than I'm out of politics. <laughs> yeah, and being out for this last cycle, I'm sure is a breath of fresh air where you're not getting questions about Twitter and shit constantly. Yep. You, yep. when you first came back, you, you got back, um, I imagine pretty quickly. So you were there for eight days. So around December 10th, December 11th is when you um, woke up from your, I, I assume it's a medically induced coma, yeah, right? It was. And that you were put on TV mm-hmm. very quickly after. Like there's a, a video of you from um, right after you get back and your unit is returning and you lost, it was clear you had lost a bunch of weight. Do you look back now and think, what in the world was I doing on TV so soon after something horrific like this? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to, and my goal throughout this whole thing, because it's crazy as fuck, and you, I'm, you feel the same way I'm sure about you. I mean, you got shot in a war. That's insane. Mm-hmm. Right. There, most people- Like still, like military, looking back on it, like that is, I went to a different country and somebody shot me. <laughs> like, yeah. That's, yeah. it is fucked up. And you came back with like two less legs than you went with. And like, still, I'm you. sure some days you wake up and like, oh shit. Yeah. I still don't have my legs. Yeah. Every morning, you know, but I get the good parking spots now. So it's all, yeah. all good. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, I look back on that and I was still kind of fighting myself. And I mean, the, I was so busy trying to tell other people that I was fine that when really I was convincing myself, I had to adjust, I had to find my self worth out. So basically I was in an open marriage, but nobody told me about it. And so the, <laughs> the good old Jody, the old <laughs> yeah. Jody thing. And um, so I looked at it as, well, I, nobody wants a guy with no legs. And so it made me feel like shit. So I had to really find my own self worth and, figure that out. And at the same time, I'm on the news. 
I hadn't found out yet about the Jody situation right when I was on the news. Um, but yeah, I wanted to teach people the things I'd learned without them having to go through it because like we discussed, it's nuts. And so the things, if it can positively impact people's lives, which is why I tweet about it every December 2nd, walk people through it. It's so they can look at, at life maybe in a little bit of a different perspective and maybe it will make their day a little bit brighter seeing that things work out if you have a positive attitude. And so, uh, yeah, it's a little embarrassing looking back, especially because the medications that they put you on, that was back when, as you remember, if you're like, I'm a little sore, they're like, here's a big fucking bottle of pills and here's how many you take per day. And it's just, you're kind of numb. Here's a bucket of Ambien so you can sleep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, so yeah, I look back on that. That's a different person that I see. And, and I and think so that that's it, so key to point out that it's a different person. Also, you're not just like a, somebody who lost their, his legs in Fallujah. Like you are still John and finding who you are post-military. What was that process like for you finding out who you were outside of the army? It was, uh, it was very lonely because like I felt lonely at home even. And so I came back and my whole life I wanted to be an infantryman. Now I was, I was in the guards. So I was in full time. My regular job was I worked in an ink factory in Minneapolis. It was a good job, hardworking job, well-paying, but I wasn't going to be working in an ink factory anymore. Obviously I wasn't going to be an infantryman. So I really had to figure it out and find what I was good at. And when you're doing that for so long, that becomes your life. And you don't really think about, I could do this or I could do that. Well, now I was forced to. And, uh, I thankfully I was in the right place at the right time and met some people that worked for the recruiting command for the Minnesota National Guard. And they had said they, I was at the governor's fishing opener and I, they asked me to say a few words. So I said a few words, the commander of the recruiting battalion came up and he goes, I like you. I think you should work for us. And I said, well, I'm getting out of med boarding out. If you can get me a contracting job, a civilian contracting job with you guys, I'm in. And they made that happen. So I retired on a Friday, started work on a Monday, and I got to work for the National Guard and, and manage our advertising accounts with the Minnesota Vikings, the Minnesota Wild. It was a fun job. I got to promote the National Guard, which is something I love. I was a civilian, but I was working with the military. So it's the perfect transitional job to give me confidence, to give me a place to be and help me kind of get back to normal a little bit. And we talked to veterans who are disabled veterans who were in the VA system and learning the military does a terrible job across the board of teaching you how to one, like go through the VA system, how to get involved in the VA system, how to get your health care from the VA. Was that process for you difficult, um, like managing going through the VA and figuring out all those steps? It wasn't, they, the, Walter Reed, there was a VA employee that walked me through it and they were in contact with the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs service officers to help file the claim, go through everything. So the minute I was, I mean, I had my proposed rating a month and a half before I was out. So it went pretty smooth. It was a whirlwind and now I do that as a, as a career as I'm, I'm a veteran service officer here in Minnesota. So I wish I remembered more about the process, but it, it, it wasn't difficult for me. I think because the severity of my injuries and B, how public it was. It was on the, the CARE 11 news here followed me through the process because there hadn't been- so oh, somebody in. like you doesn't get the care they need. The news is ready to fucking oh, bounce on that. And they love that here. The, the news station here, anytime the VA shits in the wrong bathroom, it's the top story. And so uh, they, our deployment was like 3,600 from our brigade in Minnesota. And I was the first very severely injured that had survived that hadn't been, we had had KIAs. And so it was a very public thing. My parents, you know, when, when it was an unnamed soldier from Badness Heights that had been severely wounded, my parents and it, talked to the news and so it, it became a top thing and it ended up, it was a good thing. They had meant to help because they had helped and the community helped me build a handicap accessible home. 
So that was kind of the thought behind it. But um, the whole process with the VA for me did feel pretty smooth. Now my situation, I mean, when the legs are gone, there's not much to evaluate. There's other right. injuries and stuff too, but very clearly it's pretty, connected. Right. Exactly. And you, now I imagine in the position that you're in and helping and being an advocate for other veterans, I think that that is the best thing that people who have been injured in combat, they come back and put themselves in those type of positions where they can help others because it's so almost like a sigh of relief as a veteran when you walk in and you talk to somebody that you know they have been there too because it is it is scary like navigating all these different systems and i'm no longer in the military what am i doing talking to somebody in those offices who's clearly been there before is i would imagine like a sigh of relief for a lot of your um clients it is yeah and, and in minnesota you all 87 counties have to have county veteran service offices to help with this process and to be a cvso you have to be a veteran that's a state law and so they know when they're coming in that they're talking to someone who's been through it um and tim who was in the seat behind me he works for me in in that office as well so i get to work with my best oh, friend wow. every day and so we've been through it we've been there my other staff has has been to combat and has been there so um it is it's a very rewarding job it's an interesting job because you hear story you know similar to your guys podcast you hear just funny shit you hear sad shit um it's no single day is is the same so i'm very glad to be doing that that's i started that right when i left politics i was able to, to get in that role and and uh work for that county and it's it's been awesome and you're crushing this job you're doing things in media what's next for you john i i you know what if I don't want to change life right now. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. I got my 16 month old girl and with the job, one of the things I love about my job, we get a, a bunch of it. You start with 24 vacation days. And so I use those to go uh, and give speeches at different businesses around the United States, around Minnesota. Uh, and so it's, I get to be on the power trip morning show every Friday. I enjoy every day I wake up. I always have something to look forward to. And so with that, I don't want to mess it up. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like a dream right now. I can't believe looking back on that day. I can't believe how my life turned out today. Yeah. I am the same exact way. Like I feel so fortunate in something I was talking about it just to, in fact, a few minutes ago when we were recording the rest of the show and I had mentioned that I wasn't wearing PPE whenever I got shot four or five inches faster, me walking through that house, it goes straight through my gut and I'm probably dead. And right. you think about four or five inches and the impact that like our show has been able to have like through helping people with mental health and, and stuff like that. I'm so fortunate to be in this position and I know you feel the same way. I want to mention your book before we let you go, because one, I always laugh when enlisted guys like myself or ladies have books because there's no shot your drill sergeants thought you would ever be a writer of a book, right? <laughs> oh fuck no! Yeah, or my my school teachers when they when they came to my book signing event. This when it motherfucker first came out, wrote a book. <laughs> yeah, they're like, and they'd always say, my teachers would always say, "Just so proud of you," and I'd see on their face, and I just want to say, "Just tell me you're shocked. That's okay. I'm shocked <laughs> yeah. too." If I was your English teacher, I'd go back and try to edit myself and be like, oh, this is a comma splice. You had a hang we had a dangling participle here every now and then. But I love that you titled the fact that your book Still Standing. How did you come up with that title and what does Still Standing really mean to you? So when I woke up at the hospital and I started learning of the injuries that weren't visible, mainly my pelvis had been shattered they had they were honest with me and said it, there's not a great chance that you're going to walk again it's going to be possible but wearing prosthetics might be just to get upright and maybe to reach over and grab something to get out of your wheelchair they said we're not sure that the surgery is going to be able to piece it back together enough that your weight can be supported on prosthetics on your pelvis so the and i in my mind i was like there is no chance that i'm not walking again and that that's i'm not going to be using a wheelchair that's as my what i was going to ask means. you were you downtrodden or were you going to be like fuck that i'm doing this right i was downtrodden a bit but but it was a challenge as well and 
a lot of the stuff at Walter Reed, they know what they're doing. And a lot of times they they know, they know that it's troops. And if you're like, I don't think you can do this. You're like, the fuck I can't. Oh, good. And now so, I got something for you. I am going right. to do it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to do and it so, liquored the fuck up too. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it, it, that part of it, the fact that it, that I was able to now walk out, I walked out of Walter Reed nine months later. That's why I wanted it to be still standing. Love it. Go check out Still Standing. I'm sure they can get it at Amazon, but we always support local uh, bookshops instead. If you can find it or go to your website, right? What's your website? Yes. John M. Creasel.com and it's K-R-I-E-S-E-L.com. And that's also where uh, people can hire me to share my story with their team. And I, I make sure when I share the story that it's not a sob story, that it's obviously heavy and I walk them through it, but I make sure to inject humor, A, because that's how I I got through what I did. You got to laugh, right? I mean, at some point, you're just got to be like, this is fucking hilarious because it's so awful. Um, <laughs> and, and to make sure that they, walk, they, they leave that after hearing that story and they're uplifted and inspired rather than going, man, that, that poor bastard. I feel so bad for him because my life, I, I've never been happier in my entire life than I am today. Life is so good. And so that's what I like to share with people. And my favorite leadership adage over the years has always been bloom where you're planted. John, it's clear that you're doing that. You're blooming where you're planted. And what you what happened to you in December 2nd of 2006, right? Yes. Yeah, December 2nd, 2006, you've bounced back and you're doing amazing things for the veteran community. People obviously love you. And we appreciate you taking the time to come on Zero Block 30. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it so much, brother. Thanks for having me on. 